Good day everyone, this is Doc Ina and this is my lecture on induction and augmentation of labor. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaini. Reference for this lecture is Williams Obstetrics, Chapter 26, Induction and Augmentation of Labor. And this is the outline of my lecture. So let's do some definition of terms. Induction is a stimulation of contractions before the spontaneous onset of labor with or without ruptured membranes. When the cervix is closed and uneffaced, labor induction will often commence with cervical ripening, and this is a process to soften and open the cervix. Augmentation, on the other hand, refers to enhancement of spontaneous contractions that are considered inadequate because of failed cervical dilatation and fetal descent. Indications for labor induction include the following. Membrane rupture without labor, gestational hypertension, oligohydramnios, non-reassuring fetal status, post-term pregnancy, and various maternal medical conditions such as chronic hypertension and diabetes. Contraindications to labor induction include prior uterine incision type, especially if a patient has undergone a classical cesarean section in the past, contracted or distorted pelvic anatomy, abnormally implanted placentas, uncommon conditions such as active genital herpes infection or cervical cancer, and fetal factors that include appreciable macrosomia, severe hydrocephalus, malpresentation, or non-reassuring fetal status. So with labor induction, we have both the pharmacologic and the mechanical methods. For pharmacologic, we have oxytocin and prostaglandins, and for the mechanical methods, we have the stripping of membranes, artificial rupture of membranes, extramionic saline infusion, transcervical balloons, and hydroscopic cervical dilators. So what are the risks for labor induction? They say that a patient whose labor was induced is at high risk for cesarean delivery, especially among nuliparas. They are also at increased risk of chorioamnionitis, especially for those women whose labor is induced using amniotomy. There is also a risk for uterine scar rupture. So um, when you use oxytocin without prostaglandins, the risk for uterine scar rupture is around five-fold. Uh, labor induction using oxytocin with prostaglandins increases the risk for uterine scar rupture uh, about 15.6 fold and on the other hand we have spontaneous labor which arbors uh, uterine scar rupture risk of threefold the american college of obstetricians and gynecologists or the acog recommends against the use of misoprostol for pre-induction cervical ripening or labor induction in women with a prior uterine scar and the last risk would be postpartum hemorrhage from uterine anatomy. So what are the factors affecting successful induction? Favorable factors include multiparity, body mass index of less than 30, favorable cervix or a bishop score of 9 and above, and a birth weight of less than 3,500 grams. A latent phase as long as 18 hours during induction allowed most of these women to achieve a vaginal delivery without a significantly increased risk of maternal or neonatal morbidity. And um, it is recommended that a minimum of 12 hours of uterine stimulation and oxytocin after membrane rupture should be observed. For pre-induction cervical ripening, we have the pharmacological and mechanical methods that can enhance cervical favorability. And the condition of the cervix, which we describe as a cervical ripeness or favorability, is important for a successful labor induction. So with cervical favorability or ripeness, we use the quantifiable method to predict a labor induction outcome through using the Bishop scoring system. So as the Bishop score decreases, the success rate of labor induction declines. A Bishop score of 9 conveys a high likelihood for a successful induction, whereas a Bishop score of 4 or less identifies an unfavorable cervix and may be an indication for cervical ripening. So seen here in this table, is the bishop scoring system which we use for assessment of inducibility of the cervix. So what are the pharmacologic techniques that we use for pre-induction cervical ripening? First is the use of prostaglandin E2 and what we have now in the market is dinoprostone. 
Dinoprostone is a synthetic analog of prostaglandin E2. It is commercially available in three forms, a gel, a time-release vaginal insert, and a 10 mg suppository. So the gel and time-release vaginal insert formulations are indicated only for cervical ripening before labor induction. So for the Dinoprostone gel, so we insert this or we apply this with the woman in, sup in a supine position. The tip of a pre-filled syringe is placed intracervically and the gel is deposited just below the internal cervical os. After application, the woman remains reclined for at least 30 minutes and the doses may be repeated every 6 hours with a maximum of 3 doses recommended in 24 hours. As for the dinoprostone insert, this is a thin, flat, rectangular polymeric wafer that is held within a small white mesh polyester sac. The sac has a long attached tail to allow easy removal from the vagina and the insert provides slow release of medication that's 0.3 mg per hour than the gel form. We use this as a single dose that's placed transversely in the posterior vaginal fornix and following insertion, the woman should remain recumbent for at least 2 hours. The insert is removed after 12 hours or with labor onset and at least 30 minutes before the administration of oxytocin. Just a warning though, prostaglandin E2 preparation should only be administered in or near the delivery suite to guard against uterine tachycystole. When contractions begin, they are usually apparent in the first hour and show peak activity in the first four hours. And oxytocin induction that follows prostaglandin use for cervical ripening should be delayed for 6 to 12 hours following prostaglandin E2 gel administration or for at least 30 minutes after removal of the vaginal insert. Side effects of prostaglandin E2 include uterine tachycystole and this is the most common uh, side effect of dinoprostone. This is uh, defined as a more than 5 contractions in a 10 minute period and it should always be qualified by the presence or absence of fetal heart rate abnormalities. Because uterine tachycystole associated with fetal compromise may develop when prostaglandins are used with pre-existing spontaneous labor, such use is not recommended. If tachycystole follows the 10 mg insert, its removal by pulling on the tail of the surrounding net sac will usually reverse this effect. Irrigation to remove the gel preparation has not been shown to be helpful. We exercise caution in the use of uh, dinoprostone for women with ruptured membranes, glaucoma, or asthma. Other in contraindications include the following, a history of dinoprostone hypersensitivity, suspicion of fetal compromise or CPD, unexplained vaginal bleeding, women already receiving oxytocin, six or more previous term pregnancies, contraindication to vaginal delivery, or women with a contraindication to oxytocin or who may be endangered by prolonged uterine contractions, for example, those with a history of CS or uterine surgery. Next is prostaglandin E1, or what we call misoprostol. However, this is, this is a drug that's considered illegal here in the country, uh, but it is still used in some other countries as the preferred cervical ripening agent. So because it's illegal here in the country, I will not uh, discuss this in too much detail. But just, to, but just in passing, this misoprostol is a synthetic prostaglandin E1 that is approved as a 100 or 200 microgram tablet for peptic ulcer prevention. It has been used off-label for pre-induction cervical ripening and may be administered orally or vaginally. So the ACOG uh, reaffirmed its recommendation for use of the drug because of proven safety and efficacy. But here in the Philippines, we don't use misoprostol and it's considered an illegal drug. The third option will be the nitric oxide donors. The rationale for the use of nitric oxide donors is that nitric oxide is likely a mediator of cervical ripening and uh, cervical nitric oxide metabolic concentrations are increased at the beginning of uterine contractions. And cervical nitric oxide production is very, very low in uh, patients with post-term pregnancy. Nitric oxide donors are in the form of isosorbide mononitrate and glyceryl Trinitrate. Isosorbide mononitrate induces cervical cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2 and it also brings about cervical ultrastructure rearrangement similar to that seen with spontaneous cervical ripening. However, despite this, clinical trials have not shown that nitric oxide donors are as effective as prostaglandins for cervical ripening. 
How about the mechanical techniques for pre-induction cervical ripening? We can use a trans cervical catheter. So we insert the Foley catheter through the internal cervical os and downward tension is created by taping the end of the catheter to the thigh. A modification of this is what we call the EASI or the extra amnionic saline infusion which consists of a constant saline infusion through the catheter into the space between the internal os and placental membranes as seen in this uh, picture. Chorioamnionitis was significantly less frequent when infusion was done compared with no infusion. We can also use hygroscopic cervical dilators, and that is what we call the laminaria. Laminaria actually is a seaweed, which looks like a small wooden rod. And these mechanical dilators have been successfully used for more than 40 years now when inserted before pregnancy termination. So when we insert this in the uh, cervical canal, it absorbs the moisture and it expands, and the act of expanding also dilates the cervix. Now, their use appears to be safe, although anaphylaxis has rarely followed laminaria insertion. And dilators are attractive because of their very, very low cost. So now we go to the methods of induction and augmentation. Labor induction has primarily been done with the use of amniotomy, prostaglandins, and oxytocin alone or in combination. So we can use prostaglandin E1 in the form of misoprostol, either oral or vaginal. Again, this is illegal in our country, so we don't use this. We can use oxytocin as a method of induction and augmentation. So the induction or augmentation may be continued with solutions of oxytocin given by infusion pump. And incidentally, oxytocin is the first polypeptide hormone that is synthesized and this is an achievement for which the 1955 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded. Oxytocin may be used for labor induction or for augmentation. And the ACOG recommends that uh, fetal heart rate and contraction monitoring uh, be done with, with oxytocin use. In general, oxytocin should be discontinued if the number of contractions persists with a frequency of more than 5 in a 10-minute period or more than 7 in a 15-minute period or with a persistent non-reassuring fetal heart rate pattern. When the oxytocin is stopped, its concentration in plasma rapidly falls because the half-life is just 3 to 5 minutes. So the uterus contracts within 3 to 5 minutes of beginning an oxytocin infusion and that the plasma steady state is reached in, uh, in about 40 minutes. So for the dosage of oxytocin, we use a 1 ml ampule that contains 10 units, usually diluted in a 1 liter of crystalloid solution, and is administered by infusion pump. A typical infusate consists of a 10 or 20 units of oxytocin, which is 10,000 or 20,000 mu or 1 or 2 1 ml vials mixed into a 1 liter of lactated ringer solution, and this results in an oxytocin concentration of 10 or 20 mu per ml, respectively. To avoid bolus administration, the infusion should be inserted into the main intravenous line close to the venipuncture site. And these are the regimens that we can use. We can uh, use a low dose or a high dose uh, oxytocin regimen. For They say that for the high dose regimen, uh, there is higher risk of uterine tachycystole. The third method of induction and augmentation is doing an amniotomy, and this is the artificial rupture of the membranes, which we sometimes call a surgical induction. And of course, this can be used to induce labor, and it always implies a commitment to delivery every time you do an amniotomy. Elective amniotomy is a membrane rupture with the intention of accelerating labor. Amniotomy done at 5 cm cervical dilatation accelerates spontaneous labor by 1 to one and a half hours. During amniotomy to minimize cord prolapse risk, dislodgement of the fetal head is or should be avoided. And for this, fundal or suprapubic pressure or both may be helpful. And some, con some clinicians actually prefer to rupture the membranes during a contraction. With early amniotomy, however, there is, of course, the increased incidence of or the risk of chorioamnionitis. The main disadvantage of amniotomy used alone for labor induction is the unpredictable and occasionally long interval until labor onset. 
Amniotomy augmentation, on the other hand, is when we perform amniotomy when labor is abnormally slow. And the ACOG actually recommends the use of amniotomy to enhance progress in active labor, but cautions that, of course, this may increase the risk of chorioamnionitis. The last method that we can use for induction and augmentation is membrane stripping. And membrane stripping involves the, the usage of fingers to separate the chorionic membrane from the decidua of the lower uterine segment. And this separation uh, releases the prostaglandins, which can cause... Uh, uterine contractions. This can induce labor and thereby prevent poster pregnancy. The drawbacks for membrane stripping include pain, vaginal bleeding, and irregular contractions without labor. So in summary, we have defined uh, induction and augmentation and also uh, cervical ripening. We also discussed the indications, contraindications and the techniques for labor induction and also we we discussed some pre-induction cervical ripening techniques, both pharmacologic and mechanical, and finally, some methods of labor induction and augmentation. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site.